Hello and welcome. My name is Christian Kasim Lorm and I'm a lead data scientist at John Snow Labs and I have been working in data science and big data for almost 10 years now. And today you will be learning how to apply automated text generation and data augmentation techniques for medicine, finance, law and e-commerce. And we will be using for this the NLU library. The NLU library is a simple wrapper around Spark NLP, which itself is a big data library focused on being the most accurate, scalable and fastest library out there. And in just five years since its release, it has acquired millions of downloads, has become the most accurate in the industry, is trusted by various companies and recognized by technology experts with various awards and honors and it became the most used NLP library in the industry. And if you look at all of the features, you can really see why that is so. It covers all of the advanced transformer and deep learning architectures, covering all of the biotology models, and of course, more simple tasks like tokenization, spell checking, and much more with over 9,000 models in over 200 languages, all backed up with peer reviewed papers, and available in all of the common cloud environments and every language since you can use it all with our dockerized APIs. And the NLU library gives you all of these features in one single line of code. And how does it work? You simply need to know two functions, the nlu.load method, which takes in the name of a model and returns in a model object. On this model object, you can call dot .predict. For example, you could say nlu.loademotion and then call on the model dot .predict. And this will return to you the predicted result of joy in a pretty pandas data frame with all extra features in separate columns. And all of this works on all Pythonic data structures like strings, lists of strings, pandas data frames, and all kinds of other data frames like Spark, Ray or Dusk. And now we come to the meat of today's tutorial. Text generation and its use cases in the industry and how to perform it yourself. You are all most likely already familiar with energy systems from your daily life. Examples are Alexa, Cortana, Google Assistant or even Siri. And many more are running in the wild. And most prominently, they can also generate creative stories like poetry, uh, narratives or even fake news, which can be used for many kinds of things. And now we can get to our notebook of today. To play with the notebook of today, all you need to do is just click on this link here and this will open the notebook or the GitHub page with the link to our notebook of today. You can just click here, open a new tab and you are good to go. If you don't have access to the um, slides right now, you can simply Google John, oops, John Snow Labs and a new GitHub and click on the first link. And then everything we are doing today is in the examples folder. And then you click on webinar and then data augmentation and text. And in there, there's the notebook I just showed you. And then this you could also open in a new tab. And now we are good to go. In the notebook, you can click on the top left here to open up the table of contents. And you see, we really have a lot planned here. And so let us get started right away. You can run the first cell to install PySpark and NLU. And then we are good to go. Today, we will be playing with GPT-2, the generative model from OpenAI. So how do you use that with NLU? It's very simple. We already learned. All you need to do is import NLU and then you say NLU.load and you need to know the name of the model. It is GPT-2. And then we store this in a variable called GPT-2 pipe. And this will download the GPT-2 pipeline for us and it shows it's 400 megabytes large and it's already ready. And to generate text with the GPT-2 model, all you need to say is GPT-2 pipe dot predict. And let's say we want to generate for my favorite food is. And let's store this in a variable. Let's call it generation df and let it run. And the model generates my favorite food is. I love the way it 
it's cooked and so on. And so now to license and see this, we can say generation df dot generated, and then we can say dot ilog at position zero, and then we can simply print this, and then we see it nicer formatted. I love the way it's cooked. I love the texture. And so on, right? So, aha, already pretty creative. Let's see if we can generate another of these examples. And let's put these two together and print this and run this. Ah, and what did we get? We see this is not so cool. We got generated two times the same string. Why did that happen? Let's see if we can change something about this. Maybe there are some parameters we could tweak on the model. So to see the parameters, we can configure on the GPT-2 model. All we need to do is take the pipeline and say GPT-2 pipe print info. And this will show us all the tweakable parameters. But we mainly just care about one and we'll explain them all in a minute in detail. We can just copy paste the set do sample and then just replace this with the actual pipe and set it to true. And let's see what happens after we set it to true. Interesting. Now we actually got two different generation results. The first one is one time we had a family's lunch at a new location called our home. And the other one says my favorite food is, and now there's a link, let's click it. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's done. Okay. Can happen sometimes. You're not a chicken man. And now this is also not a real link. But interesting, right? This is not getting random. So let's go back to the slides for a minute and understand a little bit of the theory and what just happened here. And then we get right back to the code. So what did just happen there? We noticed when we set the parameter the do sample to true, the generations became random and non-repetitive. And when we, when we didn't set it to true, so we used the default value, which is false, the generations were repeating. To understand what is happening there, we must first understand what is a language model. But to understand the language model, we must quickly remember what is a probability distribution. You might remember a probability distribution is a simple function which maps elements from its sample space to probabilities. A simple example would be a coin flip scenario where we could say or omega, the sample space is head and tails. And for every x, we assign a probability of 0.5. And if we have a six-sided dice, analogously, we have six sides. We could visualize the probability distributions for the fair or unfair scenario. And of course, we see them changing. And now, what is drawing from a probability distribution? It simply means we use an algorithm to simulate what the probability distribution itself is modeling. So we will be learning uh, about a few of these algorithms, but now we can better understand language models. A language model is simply a probability distribution where the sample space, omega, is the set of words in a human language or the vocabulary the model was trained on. So P of hello should tell us the probability of a sentence starting with hello and P of world given hello should tell us the probability of the word world occurring given that the text or a sentence started with hello. A language model is simply modeling what the distribution of words in a human language is. And it can also of course model their conditional dependencies when a given token or word has already appeared. And now how do you generate text with a model? Well, it is simply drawing elements or sampling from this probability distribution. We can use p of x given y to generate a text given a starting prompt or starting text. And once we have picked an x token from our distribution, we can take the new sequence together with the new token and feed it again to our model and pick another token and repeat this and repeat this until we have a sequence of the length we prefer. And now finding and creating this probability distribution P has been solved by large language models and they are what we are using today to perform these tasks. And our main concern is shaping and sampling for these from these distributions. And now a final example to really understand what we're talking about. Let's say we start with a string it's peanut and then we want the probability of what could be the next word. And the model could say, hey, it could be butter. And then given, right, we take the next token, it's peanut butter. We ask the model again, hey, what should be the next token? And it says, hey, it could be jelly, right? The highest probability is jelly. And then we say, okay, we take it's peanut butter jelly. And then what would the model say next? It says time, right? And then 
it put either after we feed it again, peanut butter jelly time, it would say um, either end of sentence, right? This could be a special symbol that says, okay, I'm done generating, or it could generate a couple other tokens, but this would be the most likely one. And now, how do you get a bit more control of picking from this distribution? Because all we did so far, right, is we just picked the highest token, right? And this is exactly the reason why we got repeating generations previously. We were using an argmax based sampling algorithm, which simply picked the token with highest probability. But there are more sophisticated ways to pick your token from those probabilities, the main two prominent ones are the top k sampling where you say from the top k tokens is top k sampling where you say pick from all the tokens only the top k one and then pick from those k tokens randomly or on the other hand you can use top p sampling where you ask for the first tokens whose collective probability is at least p so we could use p of 0.5 and then we see ah, the first four tokens together, if you sum up, they have a probability of at least 0.5. And so these could also be combined together. And we also have the temperature parameter, which reshapes the softmax, which in the very end creates the distribution for our sample set. And so in an intuitive way, you can say higher values for k and p and even t, they would make the model more diverse and risky and more creative but also more crazy and less coherent and logical. And if you tune those values more down, they become more generic and more logical, which as we will see later, can be just what you want in some use cases. And now essentially what we have been doing so far or have been defining now is prompt engineering. The art of prompt engineering is finding the good texts or strings, right? These are the prompts which you give your model to generate a good text which satisfies your demands. So, so you could ask the model, suggest me a good sci-fi movie, and it just will generate gibberish, like I'm not sure if I'm going to do this, but I'm able, blah, blah, blah. So this is not very useful, but on the other hand, you could give the model something like generate me a top 10 movie list, the matrix, the terminator, the tree, and then it will start to actually generate more movies. And this is because under the hood, right, by conditioning the model on these tokens, we reshape the distribution in a way that only tokens which are related to movies and also are numbered are having a higher probability of occurring. And the other prompt makes rather garbage tokens, not relevant for our use case, appear. And now that we have understood those parameters, let's get back to our notebook. All right, where did we leave off? We learned that if we set two sample to true, the model starts generating random samples from the word distribution. And if we use the default value of true, the generations are deterministic. Now for the next segment, I have a little function for us prepared, the generate with GPT-2 function and print generation results function, which basically take a GPT-2 pipeline and the prompt or an array of prompts and it will use those prompts to generate text for us and connect it in the lists of data frames and then optionally also print them for us, which will be very handy so we don't need to repeat our code. And so let's try it out right away. We just need the function here and we just need to give it the GPT-2 pipeline we have loaded and we could say something like, hello, my name is GPT-2, I love 2 and then let it generate. And it says, hello, my name is GPT-2. I love to play. I love it. My wife plays me on the other team and we always play and so on. So interesting. But now let's explore some of the parameters. And how can we see the parameters we can tweak? We can just use the GPT-2 pipe and call print info and it will show us the parameters we can tweak. So this cell right here has a little helper code for us, which we can use to test out the range of parameters on our model. Right here, it's always calling um, do sample and always basically changes the temperature. So let's see how a set or a series of temperature values affect the model. And so our helpful generation function has always numbered every generation for us and we get things like, hello, my name is GPT-2, I love to play. GPT-2 is coming to PlayStation 4 for PS Vita and PS3 with PS4 Pro titles for release 4 and so on. 
So, we don't have time to read this all, but I encourage you, pause it and check it out. But the main thing we notice, as we get closer and closer to zero, point, uh, to zero, the generations become more and more repetitive. Since we are always generating three times with the same parameters, we suddenly see, aha, it has generated exactly the same string. Hello, my name is GPT2. I love to drive even though blah blah blah, something with Bitcoin, right, in every sentence. And so I encourage you, play around with a couple more parameters here and try out a couple other values and you can get a more of an intuitive feeling for these parameters. Now we will be coming to some domain specific text generation use cases. And so our first cell here demonstrates how we can use it for structured financial data. We can simply define a prompt in the shape where we have in every row the historical price of an asset. We could say this is the weekly price of Google or some stock and the first week is good, bad, good and then this is again another good week. You can see it's increasing and so we hope GPT-2 is able to give us a label for the structured data. I recommend you should set the um, temperature lower and also the top P and top K since you don't want the model to generate all kinds of tokens but only one within the label set and maybe additionally a little description. On top of this we must also disable the repetition penalty since we want it to repeat the label and not punish it for that and then this would give us the label for this prediction. So in this case, right, the model would predict, ah, this is great, and then it predicts a lot more gibberish, but we could simply create a pipeline that starts splitting on the new line, basically, right? So we would need another classifier or tweak maybe a little bit the length of how many characters or token we want generated. On the other hand, for medicine, we could use GPT-2 to generate treatment recommendations based on some problems a patient might have. And so I looked this up in advance, right? I looked up what is the common treatment for cough, headache, and nosebleed, and they are and they are treated respectively with promethazine, naproxen, and so on. And we want to see if the model can autocomplete a treatment for us for diarrhea. And so for this, we want the model to be a bit more creative and not repeat every token, right? We now want new tokens. In this case, the model will predict for diarrhea that you can treat it with sodium chloride and I googled it, this really would work. And then even it starts making up a couple new diseases and their, the treatments for them. And then again, we would need some pre-processing to remove this gibberish. On the other hand, a very popular application of GPT-2 is copywriting, where you basically want to create some marketing texts or get inspired to write a text which sells your products. So now let's imagine we want to make a startup and we want to sell some hoodies, some soap and some beard in our dropshipping Shopify store. And so for this, we can go to Shopify and get inspired because they are so nice. They have a blog where they explain us how we could write our own product descriptions and we can get very inspired from that, right? Because we can take, they have here a couple sample descriptions like can't stop buying plants, unbearable, don't worry us and so on, right? So we could uh, steal <laughs> or, or copy, I guess, right? These product descriptions. And this is what I did here for us. We have three descriptions for hoodies, soap, and beer. And what we will do is we make the model very creative and we enable sampling. And then we tell the model, this is the prompt and please add some more tokens. I only copy pasted the first one or two sentences from those product descriptions. And then we can tell GPT-2 complete the text for us. And if we would apply that, what would we get? For the hoodies, we would get something like made in UK for the largest selection this will come in a huge container, so don't burn your hands. And then on the uh, soap side, right, the model says, oh, this soap is so nice. Um, it has the uh, ingredients, water, cinnamon, starch, and natural balance, and even six dimensions. So this one is not so logical. We could make it a bit more logical. For the beard products, we get things like flexible, durable beard branding styling products will stay up through the day for long lasting results. Or you can always customize your own personal style with each application of beard branding styling masks. Or this shampoo is compatible with every hair type and so on. So it's really interesting. You can get, really get lost in there. So that's why we jump into the next segment. And I really encourage you, maybe pause the video or open the notebook and generate some more examples. Because each time you generate, you get completely new things which can spark your idea. And now on the product recommendation side, you can imagine you might have a app where you have a lot of users and for those users you have a couple products they like 
and you might want to generate a couple more products or get some ideas or, or descriptions why they might like those things. A simple way how we can make GPT-2 generate a list of top 10 things in a domain is for example my top 10 movie list is the Matrix one, the Terminator or Scarface and then on the four, in the next time you just say 4 and then ask the model to complete and it will ge generate things like the Hunger Games, Inside Amy Schumer, Wolf of Wall Street and so on. So it starts generating movie recommendations. In the next segment, right, you could even use it for video games, right, give it a list of games and generate some games, right, that's also pretty cool. Or even books, right, you could give it a couple books and generate lots of new books for your users. And in the very same fashion, you can generate a lot of song lyrics. You Google the lyrics of a song and then take the first couple phrases and give it to the model and you gotta set the output length to very high right because the song is long and then if you pause the video and read this this is really catchy and rhymy and can make awesome songs it's even pretty funny to give it a couple rap songs right i took here the fresh prince of Bel air and it starts rapping or you can give it a michael jackson song and it makes you even more Michael Jackson song <laughs> and then curses and, and, and in similar, similar fashion you could try other uh, rap songs and so this is very creative here are a couple more examples another creative application is the writing of books there are entire startups that write and generate books with AI and you can buy them today there's one Harry Potter book generated by an AI and here are a couple examples again we don't have time to read <laughs> a couple stories here but you can pause the video and skim through them yourself and depending on what kind of story you give the model if you give it some kind of Lovecraftian story or a fantasy story it will keep generating in the same style of the author or you could even give it a script of a movie and rewrite your favorite movies or you can give it some code some Scala or Python code what we have here as an example and use it to either describe your code or generate more code on top similar to what basically GitHub Copilot or other apps have been starting to do. This finalizes our segment with the purely creative writing and now we come to the part where you will learn how you can leverage generative language models for data augmentation tasks. So let's go back to the slides and learn a little bit about what is data augmentation and why it is useful for us. Since the largest language models are trained on almost the entire World Wide Web, they can generate sophisticated and realistic text about almost any topic. And we can leverage this by letting the model generate training data for our NLP problems and increase our data set with this. And we can call it augment our data set. And this can improve the accuracy of our classifier models because the more data we give it, the more accurate it becomes. And this can also be useful because the new model we will be training from this is of course, of course much smaller than the original large language model we used to create the augment data set. And how does one augment and create more training data? There are many different approaches and there is a lot of uh, research going on in how one could augment a data set. We, for our demonstration purpose, will be using a very simple augmentation method where we, we will just concatenating or cutting off a piece of text and prefixing it to our label and then we ask the model we use basically label plus text and then say the, ask the model please generate a few more words to this let's apply this in action i have prepared for us four data sets one for finance legal medical and a general one for news all text classification data sets in this case, we have for the first example a news data set with the label business, sci, sports and world for various news in the world. And the text data is in the text column, of course, and the Y label is in the Y. For this, we will reuse the GPT-2 model from before. And to simulate a setting where we have low access to data, we will reduce the amount of examples we have per class to a thousand and then train test split and then we see per label we have exactly a hundred examples. Now let's train a classifier. All you need to do is just say nlu.load train classifier. This gives you a trainable classifier and with the tra trainable classifier you can call dot fit 
on the data set which has y column and a text column so just as we have preferred it this will train for us the tensorflow model and return to us the train classifier with it we can call just as we have done and learned before the dot predict method on the train data set and look at the predictions we get for the train data after just a couple of epochs right we could have tweaked there much more and we can see aha most of these are correct, there, but there are most likely some incorrect. To figure out how many are incorrect, we can use the sklearn classification report function, which creates for us a string that we can print to see the F1 score metrics on all the classes. But this was train metrics, but this is the boring stuff, right? So what we will be doing here is we train a vanilla model first, what we have done here, right? On the standard data, which we have not modified, now we have some reference metric of the vanilla model we call it because it trains on a vanilla data set and now we will create the augmented classifier by creating the augmented data set first. So how will we do this? We need to think about how can we generically create prompts for GPT-2 or any language model to create fitting training examples for our model. And this is basically the prompt engineering part you could call it and always connect it with a bit of creativity but what you usually can do is you can take the label and then append it to the original data but only take the first 15 characters and then do that together so we get sci news and then also maybe put something in between like news headline so we get the prompt generated sci news headline company claims or the other prompt is business news headline to school shop and so on right this we can pass to our gpt2 model we would tweak it to be more creative this case right we want some creative realistic looking text and then can start generating in this loop we will generate for each label 10 examples log them all and create the augmented training data set so our data set is generated and we can see here right we basically generated a lot of fake news we can see them one by one being created here and we don't have time right to read so many news today but we have time to evaluate a model and so if you have the time pause the video and take a look but what i need to point out is that some examples that are generated might be a bit crappy like you can see here which can either be related to the randomness of the model or the data you give it for these cases you either want to have a human in the loop to check this or you can train another model to evaluate the goodness of the text generated and you would remove very outlierish text as the one we have here we cannot pass this directly to our classifier model because this has still the prompt inside and the prompt has a label inside we'll remove this before we give it to another classifier model to train on because right we don't want to leak the label and we can do this simply with a little bit of data engineering which will split off the prompt and then we have nice and clean text data which could be human text data and we can train our model on so now we have created basically 10 percent more data with the augmentation method for our model and now we can try this out again with a new classifier and see what happens if we train a new classifier on this newly created augmented data so let's see what happens we train the model in the same fashion as we have done before but just in this case we call the fit on the augmented data set. With now with the fitted model, let's see what are the metrics. And we can see if we compare the metrics of the vanilla model on the train data set to the augmented model on the same train data set, we see we improve in all of the classes. Amazing. Now let's see if this still holds up for the test data set, which really matters here. And so let's compare how well the augmented model is doing on the test data set compared to the original vanilla model and we can see here the vanilla model had around 64 percent accuracy in the business class but the augmented model had a 70 percent accuracy and in SciTech the same we have one percent increase for sports we lost a little bit and for world as well so we already achieved great results with just a little bit of data generated we could scale this a lot more by using a big data cluster and get much more training data for a model or tweak this a bit more and we can already use this model we just created by combining the vanilla and augmented model as an ensemble classifier or with something like a voting algorithm and now i have created here for us a couple of generic functions with which generalize this whole process they basically create a train and test data set by doing the train test split it does uh, fit and evaluate for us and basically creates a, creates a large augmented data set for us which we can of course everything we can completely parameterize and the most important parameter and function is for us the prompt label prefix which generates 
an augmented data set in the same fashion as we just did before, but parameterized on the prefix and the length and of course how many examples we want. And you might want to replace this function or tweak something on it because this is the main thing you want to tweak. And finally, I have wrapped everything up for us here in the compare vanilla and augmented training function, which is basically an entire data augmentation experiment for you to reuse on different data sets, which calls all of the methods above. So it first creates the train test split, then it checks if enough data is available for generation, then it does a fit and evaluate for a vanilla classifier, and then it creates the augmented data set and trains an augmented classifier on the newly created augmented data set. And finally, it prepares both the vanilla model and the augmented model, just as we have done before, and prints this all out, and then it returns the vanilla and trained model for you. So you could easily tweak this and maybe edit the generation function and uh, the augmentation function is most likely what you want to tweak, right? So just this one line you could tweak. And now in our example, right, if you go back to the table of contents, we have four examples. The one is on the news data set we just saw. And then we also have finance, legal and medical. And now I show you how easy and reusable this is. Here we have an example for all the parameters you would want to tweak or can tweak. The train test split, training settings, the generation settings. And then you can run the whole experiment with all the parameters inside. And this basically started a data augmentation experiment for us. Trains a classifier with the parameters we have to find up here. Logs the metrics of this vanilla classifier on the train and test data set and then it in this case again generates a bunch of fake news for us and it even counts and keeps track how many are being generated and so and also if you're curious pause this video and take a read and we mainly care about what's in the very bottom metrics of the augmented and vanilla model which we compare and most importantly the test metrics of the augmented model and the vanilla model down here. And we can see in some cases we definitely degraded, but in some cases we have a major improvement. In particular in side tech, right, we get 20% and in sports we get 5% and even in the world category we got 3%. So this is already very powerful. And now let me show you how you can easily recycle this on almost any data set. So now we have a finance data set, which we download here. It consists out of two labels, negative and finance. So these are tweets and we will generate some fake tweets now. The only thing we tweet is a prefix for the prompt we want. And we basically just say we want a finance tweet to make the model think, oh, that I'm going to tweet something. And then we get some tweets. So let's run this. And we get a bunch of fake tweets, all inclusive with Telegram and other links, right? If you have the time, pause or check out the video and read them. But we, again, are most curious about how did the model perform. So let's see. We have here again the test metrics of vanilla and the augmented model. And we see this time we only have a minor improvement, but this only was also very little, very little data we generated. And we could increase the number of data we create for the augmentation. And I'm sure you could get even better metrics. And then for the medical side, we have a medical data set consisting out of medical journals about COVID. And we use the content of the journal as the data and the type of journal as a label. So we have labels like frontiers of psychology, journal of medical virology and we're going to predict these labels. We need to be a bit creative. What kind of prefix are we going to use for the prompt? In this time I use reports and let's see what we will get. So our medical fake reports have been generated and we have some fake papers with some real fake links I guess, right? Again, take a look if you have the time but we want to see how did the model do. So let's take a look and we can see 40% improvement in the international journal class and 10% increasement for the MetArbix classes. Again, I'm sure if you tweak this a bit, you can get much more out of this. But now finally, as another inspiration for you, this could easily work also on a legal data set. So we have here a data set consisting out of legal clauses and as label, we have the type of clause. So there could be a legal clause about loans, investments, interest, base salaries, and so on. Let's use this in the same, but this time as a prefix, we use contract clause summary so to get GPT-2 into the legal vibe, and then it hopefully augments our model. And we see a lot of fake legal clauses being generated, right? Check them out if you have the time. But in the bottom, we mainly care again about the metrics on the test data set of the vanilla and augmented model. And we can again see a nice improvement of 4% and almost 20% in the base salary and investment classes. So now you are equipped with a new tool that you can use in your NLP pipelines, but there's much more you could learn and use NLU for. Here are a couple links you can check out, but on the slides we have a little bit more.
Besides OpenAI's GPT-2, there are also many other large language models, especially for text generation, like Google's T5 for summarization, answering questions or generating SQL text, or even Microsoft's Marian NMT to translate between 200 languages. And in the bottom here, you have a couple other tutorial sessions that I made, which you can enjoy to learn a bit more about these models if you are curious. So there are more notebooks and tutorials I recommend you to check out if you are curious, and also many more tutorials and webinars on NLU. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. I am sure you have learned a lot today. Thanks a lot and goodbye. Okay, guys, can you see me yet or? Um, okay, so I think you guys should see me now, right? Um, I will be answering uh, a couple of questions we have collected so far. Um, so one question we have from um, Danaj Randa, sorry if I mispronounce is um, what is the temperature for, right? So we played with the temperature parameter today and he, he's asking or she's asking, what is the temperature for or what does it do in NLU? And if you remember, right, we mentioned um, all the language model does, right? It picks the next word based on, if you look here precisely, it says based on the softmax of the logits. Now, if you remember, or if you might not know, what are the logits? of a uh, language model or neural network, right? For neural network, usually the last layer before the softmax is called the logit layer. And you usually have one logic, logit, which is basically a, a integer value for each class you are predicting, right? And here our class or our data set is the element, uh, each class we predict on is basically each word in the human language or in the dictionary we gave the model to train on, right? And then the logits are, we have one logit basically for every word, right? And the softmax is applied to make this a distribution. So every element, the probability is between zero and one. And then the T parameter, the temperature, right? This, this is the softmax. And the temperature parameter is just doing a small tweak. And it's dividing by T. Uh, and that is then making your distribution smaller or thinner. And then if it's higher, it makes your distribution more random. Oh, and also the words, the model, the generation will be more random. And if it's lower, it will be more logical and coherent, where it's also explained here in this slide, basically. Okay, another question from um, Han King Kao. Then let me maybe copy paste this so everybody can read what I am um, answering. All right. Oops, so do I copy paste this? Okay, one question is, how to create a model to evaluate how good the generated text is. Can you pl please provide some tips? Definitely. So there are um, a couple. Also, ideally, you would either use um, an evaluation metrics. There are a couple of things like perplexity, um, which you can look up and use there, um, or also just general analysis of how often specific uh, words are repeated. And so these are a couple ideas, but another idea is also you can collect a hundred examples which you like, and then also a couple which you don't like, and then try to train a classifier on top of that, right? Or alternatively, again, uh, I definitely encourage, look into some metrics that can be used to evaluate um, generation results like perplexity. Okay. Um, Right, I, I hope you hear me by now, right? Um, one other question is, right, what does the fit command do with NLU, right? Let me address one, uh, the one question after another. The next question, oops, I didn't copy paste this, is what is the fit command for, right? Oops, come on, I just, this doesn't want to copy paste today. And so the fit, right, it basically um, trains for you a classifier under the hood, right? So. Right, what, what does the fit command do? And does it tune also? And it basically, it doesn't exactly do tuning, right? But it does the training. So let me 
pull up an example here where we saw it. Um, here, right? You load a trainable classifier, and on it you can set just like you would in TensorFlow some parameters like the maximum epochs or the learning rate and batch size, and then you call fit, and then it will fit the model just as you would do with TensorFlow, and it will train for six, six, uh, ten epochs and the parameters you have set. All right. Um, another question. Okay, another question is how good is the state of cloud NLP services versus GPT, GPT versus Drawn Snow Labs? So let me pull this up uh, quickly, the question. All right, um, so the question is, right, you can use all of our features from the cloud um, easily. We have a service called the NLP server. Um, which is just briefly mentioned here, but there are other webinars and tutorials explaining it. We have the NLP server, which gives you access to all of these features inside of a Docker container. You can deploy it yourself, and that is then a simple API, which you can use to communicate with and get all your prediction results. And then it is, and then the question is also, how does it compare to, uh, like, I think you, you mean GPT-3, right? That has also an API. The thing is though, if you use the GPT-3 API or other APIs, your data will be shared with your Musk or OpenAI, right? And for some companies, especially healthcare companies, you, you cannot share your customer's data with OpenAI or anybody. And so there you would like to have your own private generator model like this one here. And then of course you can deploy it in a cloud. Okay, couple more questions. Um, Let's see, what do we have? Um, okay, what is the importance of the... Okay, one question is, uh, what is perplexity, right? So the question is, what is perplexity? We can Google it quickly, right? And check out the wiki the definition. But it basically evaluates for you how good a model is at predicting a distribution, right? And a low per, uh, perplexity indicates that your model is doing a good job at what it's doing and a high perplexity tells you it's doing a bad job. So ideally, I'm sure there's some sklearn.perplexity or so, which you can call and then use to evaluate your um, generations. Okay, so that is perplexity. Let's see if there's more to answer. Yeah, so the question from Harsha is, yeah, this is recorded. You should be able to see this all uh, in, a, in an hour, in a little while. It should be sent to you a couple hours or so. Um, another interesting question. Um, let me just copy paste this and then read this, right? What from um, Sate is, what is the importance of the field ontology in NLP and text and extraction and entity recognition? It's an interesting question. It's not exactly text generation related, but I can lose a couple of words about this. Um, an ontology, right, is basically a graph, right? And entities you can extract with NLP or any Rs, right? The features you extract, you can treat as a graph or as a node inside of a graph, right? And you could have entities like diseases or companies. And if you extract those, you can map them onto an ontology, right? And then you can have another NLP model that looks for all your documents, let's say they, they talk about Tesla, okay? And then you can analyze and extract all the named entities in those documents which call, talk about Tesla. And then you can use that to enrich an ontology or some kind of knowledge graph, right? And then basically you use it to map your data and access more information. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think we can do one or two more questions and then we have to wrap it up. Um, one question was, again, I can quickly repeat it. How do we find the notebook or everything of today, right? If you have the slides, um, you can access them there. And there was also a link in the notebook, but if you don't have all of this or just a recording or this video, you can Google John Snow Labs and then you get hub, right? And then you go to our GitHub page of NLU. If this loads after a second or so, right? And then everything we did today is in examples folder and inside examples, there's another folder, which my internet is, I guess, right now a bit slow over the Wi-Fi I'm using. And um, in the meanwhile, while this is loading, I checked another question. Okay, ah, crap, this is taking way too long. Um, but inside there, there's a webinar folder, right? And then inside there, there is the folder of today. 
let's load, let this load in a second and I can't I can answer another question. Um, one question again from Sate, right? Is um, what is um, the how does NLP fit into the data lake landscape? Oops. And so data lake, right? The data lake is usually a lot of raw and unstructured data, right? And then NLP, you wouldn't use it, right? At that point, you could process all your text data you have in a data lake to make it more structured. Let's say you have a trillion PDFs, a huge data lake with a million PDFs of all kinds of things. And how do you structure that? How do you, could you say, filter me all the PDFs that talk about cancer or about Microsoft? Uh, and then for this, right, you could scan all the PDFs with an NER algorithm. And then for each PDF, you suddenly have the entities and then you can give it some structure, right? And then you can structure your data lake and then it's actually something more structured, right? And now I think this is, this is, um, I, I skipped up now. Okay, now, now it's opened up. So in the example folder, there's webinars, right? And in the webinars, there's data augmentation and in there, there's our notebook of today. Okay. Other questions. Um, let me pull this up. Um, one question from um, oops, one question from Andri Elif. Can we use PySpark on premise? Um, can you maybe uh, verbalize a bit more what exactly you mean with premise? But I mean, but usually PySpark you can deploy almost everywhere. You can right. You just need to deploy a couple containers or call Databricks, and they give you a cluster, right? So this is almost everywhere. Deployable. Okay. Um, okay. We have a couple more questions. Let me just um, get them. Um, again, another question from Sate. Let me um, pull this on the screen. Um, with NLP extraction, is human in the loop a necessity? Um, it depends, right? Human in the loop is always an improvement. Nothing is ever a necessity, of course, but Depending on how right, how costly a mistake an error is for you, you might think about uh, human in a loop, right? If your NLP model is deciding about life and death or something super critical where a mistake can cost you a million of dollars, you might want to add a human in the loop, right? It's always a cost versus uh, cost balancing, right? If you can say, ah, I can hire a person for $2,000 a month or so to do the human in the loop thing, sure. If if a mistake is that costly, right? If a mistake doesn't cost you anything, you don't need a human in the loop. So it always depends what you're doing. Okay, and now uh, I think this could be the final question for today, unless there's something more popping up from Harsha. Um, could you highlight any breaking changes to be expected to Spark NLP since NLP Summit is coming close? So uh, <laughs> good question, Harsha. Um, obviously we always say no bugs uh, to expect at all, right? Um, and, and of, of course, we, we don't ever plan any breaking changes. If anything happens, it's not planned. And so, um, no, right now, no breaking changes planned. But if you if we find any, or if you find any, let us know. We do our best to not have anything break in your systems. Should everything be backwards compatible, mostly. Okay. Um. Okay, very final question now from Sate. <laughs> You're very eager with the questions, I see. But that's always good, always good to learn. And this question is, what are some good blogs uh, for state-of-the-art development in NLP, if I can recommend anything? And to be honest, um, I personally, at some point, either right there's this one hero, what's his name? Um, Visualized Transformer, or what's this guy? Ah, no, what is this? But visualize there's one really good guy making really good blog. Ah, this one, the Jalama IO guy. This one is making the, the, the best blogs in the entire NLP space. If you want to read any, read his blogs. I read them multiple times. Um, and besides that, papers are always good if you find a couple of papers. And otherwise, John Snow Labs and I myself have a couple of stuff on Medium if you are curious. And otherwise, yeah, always read papers. Get in, in a groove of reading papers. If you read a lot, then you get, you can read them actually quite fast. And then you don't need to read blogs because always read the latest papers. Or rely on John Snow Labs because we are reading the papers for you guys. So you don't have to do that. Okay. So now I think this was the final one for today. So I think we can wrap it up, guys. So thanks a lot, everybody, again. Uh, I hope you learned a lot. If you have any feedback or suggestions how this could have been a better tutorial, please share. Otherwise, feel free to connect with us. And I hope you enjoyed this, and I see you in the NLP Summit 
three weeks from now or two. And otherwise, I hope to see you in the next webinar. So have a wonderful week, guys, and goodbye.